was going in the wrong direction. At 12, I shouldn't have had a paycheck, and at 32, I should have. But um, so that's that's the first thing, and I don't know what causes that. I think for me, it was very simple. It was I thought it was going to be a really, really big thing, and I thought Chris knew enough about security. I didn't know a damn thing about security, I'll tell you that. And there are many in my industry that say he hasn't changed a bit. <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, Chris was a brilliant security mind, but my background coming out of Georgia Tech was automatic control systems, uh, and so I had a very technical background and you know one of the things that I think made ISS unique is the two founders had two very different backgrounds and two very different uh, you know kind of foundations but we brought those two together because Chris and I basically said let's build an automatic control system for risk. Humans cannot deal with the security threat on the internet. It happens too fast. It's all got to be automated and it's got to be intelligent. So let's build a security system as an automatic control system. And the thing it's controlling is risk. And if you look at the definition of risk, it's vulnerabilities times threats. So what did we do? We went out and built an automated vulnerability detection system. That was called the Internet Scanner. That was the first piece of technology that Chris pioneered. Um, our business plan said that by the summer of 1995, we'd be rocking and rolling with that thing. That didn't happen. So the second thing that I think you find as an entrepreneur is whatever you plan for is not necessarily going to be reality. And I think that's true in business, only in business, you know, you've got a balance sheet and you've got a paycheck and some, you've got someone else covering your health care benefits and you might not make your bonus, but you're not, you know, on the verge of being destitute. Um, when you're an entrepreneur, especially in that early startup phase, um, not being able to achieve those milestones with the development of your product, you know, many, many, many companies die right there. I mean, if you look at the milestones and the growth and evolution of a company, and that's when we literally turn to credit cards. I think a lot of you know our credit card story, but um, I had spent all our money. Um, and I think when I sold my house in 1998, the, the mortgage actually reflected like 320000 So I was able to mortgage it for considerably more than it was worth or than I paid for it. Um, and when we went back to the mortgage company, they said, you're, you're done. You're basically upside down in this mortgage. So we couldn't get any money out of there. Um, we turned to credit cards, which I knew as a businessman, this is an absurd cost of capital. But you again, you start acting irrational. Now, the interesting thing is, as I look back on this um, 12 years later, that was the cheapest cost of capital I could have imagined because equity capital at that time, um, had Chris and I taken super dilution because we were on our backs, it would have cost us literally hundreds of millions of dollars when you look at it through the rear view mirror. And so we were funding the company by signing up for Visa cards. We were taking the cash advance. We're using the cash advance partially to pay engineers and partially to pay all the interest payments on the credit cards that came before. So we had, we had actually written an algorithm to figure out how much had to be paid on each one of these cards. What was the maximum amount we could pay on each one of these? The minimum amount we could pay on the cards and the maximum amount we could pay to the engineers. So this kept going until about um, November. I was out raising capital, but I kept getting turned down. I think that's the third message of the entrepreneur is, um, is you know, having conviction and tenacity because I, I then felt like the monkey looking at the rubber banana again because the problem was none of the people I was talking to about raising capital had any consistent view of the internet like I had it. Um, you know, some people have never heard of it. so. You know, they asked, why would I want to secure something I've never heard of? So they were immediately put into a low probability of closed <laughs> folder. Um, there were some people saying, oh, we know all about it, but science is 
the universities and governments use it, you know, no businesses are going to use it. The universities have no money, so why would I want to fund something to a target market that has no money? Um, and so we really couldn't get off the ground, and I kept coming back and I tell Chris, Chris, I've just got to find someone that sees the world we do, the way we do, and sooner or later we'll find them. Well, we, we never did find them that fall, but we canvassed a hell of a lot of people in Boston and New York. My wife was a former Delta flight attendant, so I was using uh, Delta family benefits. You know, I was flying at like 5.30 in the morning in seat 97J. <laughs> uh, I'd, I'd wait for the last minute as to whether they put me on the plane or not. I think it's called non-rev travel at the time. Um, I'm sure they still do it for their employees, but sometimes I'd sit at the airport for two days waiting on a flight, and so it was a it was a crazy way to travel because you never knew what flight you were really going to be on, so it was hard to schedule. Sometimes I'd have to leave two days before a meeting just to make sure I got there. Um, but we uh, in the fall we ended up doing um, the, we were ready to shut down the company because we hadn't gotten the technology where we wanted to yet. And we struck a deal at the kind of 11th hour with Kevin O'Connor and we actually sold 22% of this company for $50,000. Um, and just to put that in perspective, that was October of 1995. In October of 1998, 22% of this company was worth um, over $400 million. So, if you're an investor, those are the people you want to find. Them. <laughs> that's the uh, that's the other message about um, entrepreneurial um, spirit. But just to, to keep on track here, um, we did get funding. We got funding in um, we got funding in February of 2006. Um, and it, yet in November of 1995, we were, you know, on our backs. In November of 1995, we valued the company at about $250,000. In February of 2006, um, Greylock and Sigma and Kleiner Perkins valued the company at $14.6 million. So our, our pitch got a lot better between November and February. Uh, but we raised three and a half million dollars, and we have never looked back. It, we began hiring, um, and you know, we a couple of things we did at the beginning, which I, I think are important looking back on. One is we basically wrote Chris and I what we wanted the culture of the company to be like. I mean, we, we documented it, and we said we're going to live this. And you know, because every company has a culture, it either happens or you know, you can kind of define it and then work toward it. And it's got to be natural. It's got to come from the leadership. Two is, we said we had a profit motive. So this was before the bubble. Um, and I think all businesses need to have a profit motive. While the bubble was going on, we never really understood it. We tried like hell to get profitable and stay there. And the third thing we did is we hired a team of people that were incredibly compatible um, that had come from different walks of life, but there again, I think we were lucky because even today, every single person in this room struggles with the right skills, chemistry, you know, uh, and you know, kind of drive in their people, and that is to me is the hardest thing to do in a business is not just get the right people on the bus, but get them in the right position and get them working the right way. Um, we went from. Uh, the beginning of 1996, uh, with about four or five people, we ended the year at about 40. We had opened up Europe and Asia. Why did we do that? Um, our board was not for it, um, but we were operating on a simple rule of thumb that he who gets locally first is always the leader. And as I, I've worked internationally for about 20 years, and one of the things I always see is like, why is uh, Give me the name of a company that's gone out of business. Um, why are they the number one company in Brazil or in some of these large markets like the UK, etc.? In most cases, it's because they were there first. They set the standard, and you know that's the one people became familiar with. So 
we were first in almost every market we went to for internet security, and now we enjoy just unbelievable uh, market shares, and so that's why our international business is so big at this size of a company. Um, in Japan, we've got like 73% market share. Um, in uh, Australia, we have something like 65% market share, and, and so we are just overly dominant, significantly larger market share than we have in our own backyard. Um, we grew the company, we took it public in 1998. Um, we had the Varsity Cater, our IPO um, celebration over around the corner. And, you know, that, had I served, you know, Chateaubriand, my employees would have walked out. It wasn't our culture. You know, our culture was Varsity. Our, one of our value statements is be frugal, you know, use company funds as if they were your own and only use them where the customer's going to benefit. And so we had the varsity bring chili dogs in, everybody had a great time, but um, I remember waking up the next morning saying, I cannot believe we're a public company. We're 141 people. We, our CFO had been on board exactly seven weeks. Um, he hardly even knew the company. You know, we had, um, but we had, uh, we had enough of what it took to keep it together. But from there, you know, the company grew. Um, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, we grew from about 30 million to almost 200 million dollars in revenue by the time the bubble burst.